Today on the Perception and Action Podcast, my interview with Martine Lips and William Spinhoven, discussing applying an ecological dynamics approach to physical therapy. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book, Learning to Optimize Movement, Harnessing the Power of the Athlete-Environment Relationship, available now on Amazon in paperback and ebook formats. This book is the follow-up to my best-selling skill acquisition book, How We Learn to Move. In it, I discuss how we can go beyond learning basic coordination to becoming an elite mover, evidence-based principles for learning and coaching optimal movement. Take your game from proficiency to mastery. Now on to the show. Okay, today I'm joined by Martine and William, who um, are going to tell us about their experiences developing uh, physical therapy and, and a bit more um, courses uh, using a, an ecological approach to so kind of their experiences with it. So to start off with us, maybe I'll start with you, Martine. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks for having us. My pleasure. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Martine. Uh, uh, I work as a sports physical therapist. I've been working as a sports physical therapist for 10 years now. Um, finished my master's in 2018. And ever since that moment, I've been pretty much uh, reading up and adopting the ecological approach in, okay. in my daily work. Um, I mostly see patients or clients with lower extremity injuries um, and predominantly ACL rehabilitations in mm -hmm. uh, various sports disciplines. Um, besides that, I'm a lecturer uh, at the SOMT University of Physiotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, where I teach at the Masters of uh, Sports Physical Therapy. And I pretty much teach together with my colleagues, well, everything regarding motor control and motor learning, uh, and then through an ecological dynamics perspective or approach. Mm -hmm. um, and since last year, and of course you know about that, um, I am well the co-founder of uh, the Sports Practitioners. Mm -hmm. It's a platform William and I uh, and someone else created uh, for courses and information. Well, at first uh, regarding the ecological approach, and then adopting that approach in physical therapy and sports physical therapy. Okay, great. So that's uh, pretty much about my background. Yeah, no, no that's great. And uh, William, how about you? Uh, yeah, I also got a background in physical therapy for like 10 years now, I guess. Uh, I also finished my master's degree in 2019. Um, that's also where I met Martijn. I've done mm -hmm. an internship at this practice where he works. So that's kind of the fun part about it. <laughs> uh, right now, working at the Dutch uh, Department of Defense with the Dutch Marine Corps mm -hmm. as a human performance researcher. And I'm trying to uh, implement a bit of ecological dynamics uh, approach inside learning, developing uh, skill acquisition within human performance over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides that, I'm still seeing patients. Um, I do that one day a week. And that's a variety of all kinds of patients. So uh, especially uh, sports patients, uh, but also just uh, regular low back pain patient from uh, yeah, the woman next door who just can <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, pull up something from the floor. So uh, it's quite a priority of patients and uh, I like the combination of all the uh, different humans and their performance questions. So yeah. That's, uh, Nice. Yeah. yeah, that's that's really you have all the way yeah, kind of just basic movement to elite, you know, kind of. I think that's really a really uh, really interesting. Um, um, Marta, what kind of what in, inspired you to kind of take this approach? Do you, do was it was it um, expo exposure to Franz's work was kind of the first <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of like the other Martin I had on yeah. uh, last week? Uh, the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's where it started. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in my I remember that it was in my second year mm -hmm. uh, of my master's degree, and uh, it was the first lecture of the new year, mm -hmm. and it was Franz mm -hmm. and. 
I did know what to expect a little bit because I had some inside info from uh, from a from a colleague, mm -hmm. but um, that lecture pretty much blew me away, and um, I started to question a lot of the things that I was taught uh, mm -hmm. during my bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. um, and after that moment as well during the other lectures and uh, in, the, in the last two years of my master's, we started reading up more and more on the theory behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember studying for an exam um, and I encountered the word affordance somewhere in a book. <laughs> and I tried to, yeah. And at that point I tried to explain it to a, uh, to a colleague and I was not able to do that. And then I thought, okay, well, there must be, a lot more behind this, just than what Franz uh, wrote down in his book. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I started reading up more and more, especially about dynamic systems mm -hmm. and their, the influence on coordination, etc., and how we view coordination. Um, and as William just told you, uh, he did his internship at the practice where I worked. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the two of uh, the two of us, we just started doing a deep dive in the literature, uh, and after that. Like the, it, it was a snowball effect. We started buying books, reading up, uh, taking online courses, uh, and eventually, well, uh, talking to you uh, a mm -hmm. lot more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. We're gonna have to like get a fam a, a tree of Franz from Franz yeah. extending outwards. <laughs> All the people he's had quite an influence on a lot of people. Um, his his work. Um, well, that you, yeah. you so it's it kind of when you you started working with Martin that you William you started getting like this was. And were there particular things that you saw in what you were doing that this kind of really you connected with the ecological approach or thought, ways you thought you could do it better? Yeah, uh, there were two things. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at the research we can do as physical therapists, mm -hmm. um, diagnose people with some kind of injury or mm -hmm. um, what's wrong with them. And um, they're just not fit the whole picture. So you can take a small piece of a problem and just tell the people, right, this is the reason why you got pain. And an ecological dynamics approach is a way more holistic approach that fits that way better, I guess. So mm -hmm. that was quite interesting, I thought. And um, like Martijn told, uh, looking at Franz Bosch's courses and there was already sport minded, but we still see uh, other patients that are not really that sport minded. and. Because of that fact, I wanted to know more about eco ecological dynamics and uh, maybe a bit more about the whole ecological psychology side of it. So why are people moving like that? And how does that affordances work? And how do people get afforded to uh, kind of movement? So mm -hmm. yeah, that was what really triggered me. And like Martijn said, really dove deep in it. Um, but I think we're gonna work on it now for three, three and a half years. and. Um, we're still searching for the right uh, uh, terms and, and how to uh, apply all the theory. And it's still hard, so um, it's really nice to have conversation with people like you that can help us any further with it. So, yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah, no, I, it's been my pleasure. And I, yeah, I think it's a real area where it really can you know, uh, more work can be done than like a lot of promise. You know, there's so much initial things that seem to be suggesting it, it it's um can be beneficial so you've done so you uh, you you we developed a course for was it specific william was it specifically for physical therapists i know you had didn't you have kind of a or in a range working in a range of different like you are <laughs> kind of is that what you were targeting with your course yeah so looking at the course i've left the whole dutch marine part a little bit out of it mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people talking about ecological dynamics and skill acquisition mm -hmm. within the coaching and within the sports uh, side of it. And um, as Martijn and I mentioned that there's not a lot of that in the physical therapy side of it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's our job. So maybe it was a good idea to focus us first of all for the physical therapist and see where it goes from there on. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a choice to go that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and Martin, you've done, you've done one full iteration of the course or have you done more? How, how many times have uh, you? We, mm -hmm. We've done one. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so you, they were, you kind of uh, developed kind of the background and the, you know, explained the dynamical systems, the tractors and, and, exactly. and yeah. And, um, 
how, what, what kind of your, your, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but mm -hmm. kind of your experiences with trying, with trying to do that. I know it, it can be challenging really. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it's very challenging because something that, uh, I mean, the whole framework relies heavily on is terminology, mm -hmm. which can be very confusing and very difficult to, to comprehend. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing is in physical therapy, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that's not only the uh, um, only the case in the Netherlands, but we are very focused on chasing that one perfect movement solution. Uh, it's very explicit cueing, mm -hmm. teaching people one way to move, uh, very internally focused, and it's so embedded in how we work. I mean, that is pretty much how I got uh, educated in the, during my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of completely the opposite mm -hmm. so it's it the terminology the theory is difficult mm -hmm. but then the practical translation and uh you have to have an open mind and that change of mind to to get people to change their mind that can be difficult and i think the first time we gave the course was it was for colleagues um so they already knew our way of thinking and they already saw us working uh in uh, in physiotherapy practice this way. So it was a little bit easier for them to understand. Um, and they were open to the new ideas. Um, but explaining it, explaining it to, to students, for example, or other people, even patients, why we work the way we work, um, it poses a challenge. But people are very interested mm -hmm. and they're very open to it. Once they experience the way of working and thinking, um, yeah, yeah, they start to believe in it. Yeah, yeah, I know. In a lot of ways, it's harder than the sports side of things because you're right; it's it's exactly the opposite in a lot of ways. Yeah, William, was that kind of your your experience as well? The kind of the challenge. I know you, we talked the challenges of like explaining an attractor <laughs> um, to people. Is what what kind of did you feel the first time you did it? Yeah, it was quite challenging, uh, especially when you're looking for yourself how things really work. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing is that um, it's bigger than just an attractor. Mm -hmm. And the question is, where do you start with either your patients or also with your colleagues? And um, I think that's the biggest struggle right now, just where to start and what do you explain and how are you gonna explain things mm -hmm. to people that they understand the complexity of what you're te teaching them. And um, yeah, I think that's, quite hard sometimes but like martin said people are getting interested in it and mm -hmm. um, people are liking that they get way more uh, self-efficient and self-management in their therapy and that makes it way more fun for them but also way more effective in the end of the therapy so um, yeah I, I think it's it's a good way and we need to expand this kind of working inside our uh, practice with our patients but also with our colleagues yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think it it in a lot of ways it kind of changes things. Yeah. Um so are you you mentioned before we came on you were working on uh, uh setting up another uh, one Martin. Uh you have a couple more uh training courses coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um uh we have one uh, in a couple of months uh which is an in company course so there's actually a practice uh which is uh, interested in adopting the ecological approach so they mm -hmm. wanted a lot more background and the practical application mm -hmm. um, as a it's specific for their uh the, the patients that they see a lot. Um and um, we are actually, I think this weekend, uh, we're going to start thinking about some new dates. And it's pretty much open for everyone. We already have a couple of people who really want to join. Mm -hmm. So um, people are interested. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think the, the whole uh, ecological dynamics for framework, it's, it's like gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more people uh, are reading up about it. They hear about it. Um, not only in the coach world, but as well in physical therapy. Um, I mean, it, it is the, the the red line through uh, um, uh, through the masters that I followed and that I now mm -hmm. teach it. Mm -hmm. It's all ecological dynamics. Yeah. Um, in I mean, everything regarding motor control, motor learning. Mm -hmm. um, so more and more people are uh, are getting interested, that's which great. is a good thing, I think. Yeah, that's great. What did you find about kind of, I know uh, the, one of the challenges I always find, and I know talking to other people's 
getting the balance between the theory and the application, right? Um, if you if you kind of spend two days on theory <laughs> without actually getting to any practical things, you can kind of lose people. Uh, or you know, yep. uh, versus if you jump right into just practice, then they might not you might not have a background. So, what was your what was your experience with that? Um, that was difficult, and I think that's why William and I are very happy that we did a pilot, like a, a pilot course mm -hmm. first, um, so we could like get feedback from our colleagues as well. And um, because the theoretical part, I think uh, William, I was talking for three hours, pretty much straight without a break mm -hmm. <laughs> to cover the whole, the whole thing, and and that was just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. um, and people actually said, okay, it's time for a break, which is fine. And um, we actually uh, threw, threw the schedule a little bit around and started doing some practical stuff after the break, then back to some theoretical stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the mixing and matching of, uh, of, of theory and practice, it's very important mm -hmm. as well, because I mean, adopting this approach, uh, it, it doesn't just stop by learning the theoretical part mm -hmm. as well as we, um, teach or show uh, uh, our, our uh, patients um, how to move more efficiently, et cetera. I mean, they have to make mistakes as well through mm -hmm. mistakes you'll learn. And I mean, that goes for us as well. I make mistakes every day and I learn from them every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that the, the people who will be taking our course will have to make mistakes as well. Um, that, I, I think that's the only way you can adopt this approach um, by making mistakes, learning and Especially when applying the constraints that approach to coaching uh, to your patients, um, a lot of the times uh, people are talking about, okay, what if I do manipulate this in the task? What if I change this, do this constraint? But what would happen? Okay, what will happen if I do this? Instead mm -hmm. of actually just trying, mm -hmm. seeing what happens, mm -hmm. then okay, this is not what I want. Okay, another another uh, decision. So. Um, there has to be a lot of uh, practical stuff in the course. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. You have to, it takes a while. It sounds obvious, but you have to use the ecological dynamics approach to teaching ecological yeah. dynamics. Yeah. Right? Uh, it sounds obvious, but it's, you, you don't think that way. You think you're going to give everybody this knowledge and, Right. Um, but yeah, I think and that's a great point about the, the constraints. A lot of it is just, you have to put it into play in context. So you can't. Yeah. There's no and way you can predict perfectly. Difficult. Yeah, sorry. Exactly. No, um, and it's it's difficult as well because uh, for the for example, my colleagues um, or coworkers who are trying to adopt this approach, um, they have to explain to their patients, for example, why they do not constantly give corrective feedback, mm -hmm. why they do not constantly show them how to do the perfect execution of X or Y. Um, it, it, it's difficult to, I mean, if you're still learning yourself, then explaining to your patients that mm -hmm. actually errors and making mistakes is beneficial to their learning. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, yeah, it's tricky. It's hard. Yeah. No, this is a theme I've kind of, everyone I'm talking to, <laughs> this kind mm -hmm. of changing of the role of the coach and the instructor. Yeah. From no, I don't know everything, right? I'm not going to tell you everything. You got to figure. I'm going to help guide you in a little bit, but it's very different, and people look at you differently. And well, you must be also be the same in the kind of the military side of things, right? That's it's just as <laughs> opposite of my dominance, right? So, um, what what's your been your experience with that? Yeah, in the military side of it, it's really uh, skills and drills, mm -hmm. skills and drills, drilling, 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 and. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, so it's really hard to get in discussion about maybe we should look at it in another way. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I just want to teach them something about um, what is the, the things like the constraint-led approach or mm -hmm. Newell's model of constraint and um, why is the environment so important and the tasks they're doing in combination with um, the capacity they got within that mm -hmm. environment. And um, it's not just shooting a lot and uh, pulling the trigger a lot that makes you a better shooter. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really hard because they think that in an extreme situation where the stress is really high, 
they can grab back at those skills and drills that you've been doing uh, again and again and again. Mm -hmm. But if you then just uh, listen to the people who've been in an area where there was really uh, quite danger, even life or death, um, that's when they tell, yeah, in those situations, that's when you see when people are good soldiers or not good soldiers. And mm. uh, looking at that, that has all to do with the environment and the task in that moment. So um, I really want to show them that, okay, looking in that perspective, maybe the skills and drills aren't the way to teach people how to be a good uh, expert in those kind of situations. And it's quite hard and um, I think it's going to take a while before things really get interesting within the military, mm -hmm. but people are listening, are interested. And when I'm telling something about that or giving a presentation, it makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. like it doesn't um, uh, yeah, afford them to act different. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, that's the next. That's the next step, I guess. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a hundred percent the way certain sports like do. You know, they way it was with sports performance. People, everyone, I think they when you talk about being adaptable and all, you deal with people nod their head and they think, yeah, of course. And but then it gets <laughs> they go back to their drills. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's hard to to put it yeah. get them to put it in or convince them to put it into practice. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting, and yeah. it's it is called adaptive, but um, we're looking at anti fragile. Mm -hmm. So we got a book by uh, Nazem Talib, I guess mm -hmm. his name. Um, and the whole anti fragile part, in my opinion, is a bit of looking at an ecological dynamics approach mm -hmm. for being adaptable in that environment. And um, I think the trick about it is to make it a bit juicy for the Marines that mm -hmm. they think, oh, it's anti-fragile and really <laughs> their own language, but <laughs> the background is an ecological dynamic. So, um, yeah, that, I like that. It's quite interesting. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's, you know, it seems bad to say this, but I, it, I think it's true the packaging of it. The term sometimes coming up with a catchy term, right, to get people's attention, it helps, right? I think it helps. Uh, uh, ecological, then you know, some of the ideas have been around for a long time, but kind of the packaging of ecological dynamics by you know Keith Davids and people, I think have really helped. Uh, you know, even though that it's all that not the ideas are super new, but it, it's just the way he put, they put it all together. So, um, yeah, well, that that's really interesting, Martin. In in the in the physical physical therapy session, does is it people have worry about kind of injuries and uh, you know kind of you know the safety of doing the the ideal form moving away from that? Do people worry about patients getting hurt or is that kind of a hurdle you have to overcome? Um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure if 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 people or if physical therapists are afraid of of people getting hurt, but. Um, it's it's just it's so embedded that there is one perfect way to squat, one mm -hmm. perfect way to step up, etc. That uh, it's just difficult. For, for example, um, in people with knee injuries, ACL injuries. I mean, the whole kneeing in uh, it was something that has been, I mean, blown out of proportion as being uh, something that. Uh, uh, that has a relation, a, a strong relationship with knee injuries. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the evidence suggests otherwise. And kneeing in, if it's robust and controlled, it can be a beneficial part of an actual movement pattern. Mm -hmm. I think in that regard, um, where people have and develop their own specific uh, uh, movement patterns to solve movement problems. If it's in regard to, for example, risk factors like kneeing in, mm -hmm. that is when, uh, for example, my coworkers or colleagues uh, and other physical therapists could have troubles just letting that go and letting mm -hmm. the person be the person and letting that be the way they move. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard. I mean, I I think with him as well. I mean, we struggle with that as well mm -hmm. um, because what is safe and what isn't. I mean, there mm -hmm. is this boundary uh, where certain uh, types of movements or vari variability in movement is beneficial mm -hmm. and where it's counterproductive. Um, so that, I mean, that is a, it's a quest to find out what is good and what isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I know it is. That's a real challenging and we think we're 
good at it, but we're not really Mm -hmm. like at predicting what Mm -hmm. will cause an injury. And I know within sports, you know, after the fact, it's easy to say that that, you know, did, but beforehand, you know, what, you know, I think you're right. Um, That's a challenge knowing how to guide someone. I think um, what's functional, what's potentially injury causing. It's, it's a real, yeah. Yeah. It's real yeah, on the yeah. other end, if you if you show them the the research research that is done on, for example, variability in practice and movement variability in relation to um, ACL re-injury, mm-hmm. um, and you actually show them that moving in a lot of different ways uh, is actually beneficial in <laughs> in rehab or or well injury rehab or injury adaptation mm-hmm. that uh, that podcast uh, episode that was really good that changed a lot for william and i mm-hmm. um viewing rehab from that uh, from that perspective but once you show them that it's actually a good safe and beneficial way to 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 train your patients during longer periods of rehab um, they start getting interested and mm-hmm. actually a, a pretty new world opens opens up to them because now you're not doing your boring mm-hmm. uh, three sets of 10 of the same exercise for nine to 12 months, but now you actually can be get creative uh, and expose them to a whole lot of uh, movement problems. Uh, yeah. 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 And I'm sure that's, William, that's, you know, the, the same, you had the same problem, not only the performance side of things, but the engagement, like, you know, physio- physical therapy is famous for you people not doing it, right? not doing yeah. their stuff they were assigned <laughs> their homework and they yeah. come back and they haven't done it. Um, partly yeah. because it's boring as heck, right? <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, uh, as well, something that is, uh, interesting in ecological dynamics, like co-designing your learning environments and co-designing your rehab mm-hmm. plans with your patients. It's something it works very well. Some people really have to get used to it, mm-hmm. but a lot of my patients really like, uh, having a say, having some ownership and autonomy in their own rehab. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually presenting them with, for example, a lot of materials from barbells to aqua bags and plyo boxes. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we set the boundaries, we constrain them, so to speak. But mm-hmm. within those constraints, they are free to practice whatever they want. And they have a, they have a say in that as well. Mm-hmm. And that is something that's really interesting. People get very creative. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, yeah. Yeah, I think I think of that especially with rehab because you, you know the person has in mind, you know, they want to get somewhere, right? They want to be able to do mm-hmm. something specific, and um, that's what I always. Uh, I, sometimes it, rehab, physical therapy, and rehab focuses on what you can't do, right? <laughs> so like that's why you know some of the exercises, you know, it, they're painful and you can barely do them at all. But you, we want you to keep going. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, it's 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 a, it's a struggle. Yeah. No, I think I think that that's really interesting. Um, so you, um, uh, no, I think that that that's that's a great point as well. Having the co adaptive and so the the side of it too, I think, is really important. Yeah. Yeah. And having people. Yeah, get, and then, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, and, and what's in, interesting and really important that part is that, um, like Martin already said, that. Also, us as physical therapists need to accept that we need to learn and teach and make mistakes every day. Mm-hmm. But um, that's why it's so important that the whole theory and practice part are in there, both in the learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if I don't know exactly what I'm doing, and I'm just going to throw someone an aqua back and say, uh, good effort with that, um, then we also don't get the result we want. And then it looks funny and people are don't know what they're doing and that kind of stuff. So... Um, it is quite important to tell people why are you doing those things mm-hmm. and this is why you can do them even when you just got hurt or you just got that ACL repair um, and you still can move and, and be uh, yeah, adaptable from the moment you start with your rehab mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah, I, I think that's really important yeah setting you know explaining why, the back why we're doing this and yeah I think that's important um uh, you know, and, and the, you, like you said, with even the physical therapist explaining making mistakes is okay and we don't know all the answers. The same with the patient, right? Uh, it's a, yeah. We're exploring this together. Yeah, I think that's yeah. really important. And yeah. uh, still, I sometimes have a hard, it, it's a challenge just to keep my mouth shut 
for <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes uh-huh. and just let them figure it out. It's so easy to uh, tell them the solution or, well, try to guide them to the solution, but actually just telling them what the solution is. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, sometimes it's good to hang back, see what happens, let them figure it out for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that is um, in physiotherapy, for me, that's a challenge because Sometimes during longer periods of rehab, for example, after ACL reconstruction, yeah, we have nine to 12 months. We see those patients, we can see them develop, and we have the time to let them explore and figure it out for themselves Uh uh, with our guidance, obviously. Uh But, I mean, physiotherapy isn't free. um, And Uh some people uh, throughout insurance only have six, seven, eight, nine sessions. Uh Uh, Actually getting something to change the way they move in nine sessions, uh, that's difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're talking about constraints. That's a constraint for us as physiotherapy, mm-hmm. physiotherapists. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's challenges in that as well. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. I think that's the same in sports sometimes with co- coaches, right? You you got to get some decent performance in the short term or you might get fired, <laughs> right? You, even though you're trying to help develop in the long term, you know, so yeah, that you're right. I think that's an important constraint of, so is that when you kind of, you, you're more apt to kind of step in if you, if you have the shorter term, uh, so sometimes, you, yeah, 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 yeah it's all you can do. Yeah. 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 And sometimes it's, uh, and the, a lot of the times, uh, for people with, uh, with non-specific musculoskeletal pain, it's not always about changing the way they move. Mm-hmm. A lot of times it's about, I mean, just listening to their stories and sometimes just getting them to move. Mm-hmm. Uh, that will improve a whole lot. Um, but yes, if we really want to optimize the, the way someone moves or change the way someone moves, sometimes stepping in, showing them the solution, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's something I still do. Uh, mm-hmm. Shouldn't always do or should not at all do, but um, when there's time pressure, um, that's pretty, that, that's what we do sometimes. Yeah. Well, I mean, is, it, is it sometimes kind of a, almost like not? You mentioned not always movement. Is it like a perception affordance, like not believing they can do this? You kind of have to push them a little. Is that? Do you get that as well? Yeah. 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 Obviously. Yeah. Um, and especially in the physical therapy, we're pretty good in separating those perception and action type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So bringing that back in our practice is quite hard. And people are also not used to it. So when they're stepping inside our practice and we're just uh, throwing all kinds of things at them, but they're just starting their rehab, it's sometimes it's scary for people. So, um, yeah, the whole um, perception and action part is, is, is quite important i guess but that's where my colleagues also have some problems with implementing that inside their uh, own practice and um yeah people need to get confident with it to implement that Mm -hmm. Um, because if you don't feel pretty confident about it then yeah they're still getting separated and they're still going to say you need you should do this you should do that like martin already said and um that's quite interesting to see that also with my colleagues yeah no, I think that's that's very, that's a good point. And uh, so maybe to end things off, guys, I'll ask you both the same kind of question. Martin, maybe I'll go with you first. So it, if you had, you know, you if you want to give someone advice like that was, you know, working with a group of coaches or a group of people where you want to kind of give them exposure to ecological dynamics, whether it's in sports or physical therapy, what – I know we've kind of talked about a few ideas already, but what advice would you give them to kind of give to expose people to this, this approach? Martin. Um, let me think about that. Um, <laughs> I know that's a tricky one. That's a big it's, question. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big question. Yeah. Um, From kind of what you've seen in your course and your, your experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, that I would start off by telling people that they shouldn't, get scared or overwhelmed by the amount of amount of theory around it, mm-hmm. that um, adopting that uh, in your daily practice, it takes time. It mm-hmm. takes trial and error. It's okay to make mistakes. Uh, I think we all do. Mm-hmm. And that it's like a gradual process. You cannot go from uh, one side of the coin to the other 
just like that. I mean, for myself, I've been doing that for this for five years, and I'm still not there yet. Um, but um, and just being patient, not only for yourself, but as well for the people you work with. Mm -hmm. Just give them the time to explore and uh, explore their own solutions, movement solutions, um, and then changes will happen. And yeah, as I said, especially in, in daily work, uh, I think uh, a, a new world will open, a lot of creativity <laughs> and... <laughs> yeah, and, and I think your 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 patients, uh, even though they might find it strange at the start, they will adopt it as well. Yeah, William? because it's more natural. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. William, do you have thoughts about how, what advice you'd give someone if they were doing a course like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doing our course. <laughs> <laughs> Come no. take yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what really helped me and what I would recommend to everybody is. Find someone where you can work on the ecological dynamics. Just reading and um, um, hearing about all the theory by yourself is pretty hard. And um, being on the floor with your colleague, uh, debating all day about the constraints and implementing them, the perception action, just like we discussed. If you can do that together with your colleagues or um, with the people you're working with, that's really a key thing, I guess. Um, so that will be my best advice shared with someone. Yeah, I think that's yeah. good. Yeah, great advice. I agree. I think that some of the things in ecological dynamics, you, they kind of un make sense. They you sort of understand them, but until you actually put them into practice or t try to explain to someone else, or have it, you can realize, okay, maybe mm -hmm. I don't really know what an affordance is. I, I this is the same my <laughs> same experience I had. You you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's an opportunity. <laughs> Right, but then you kind of, is, or an yeah. attractor, even an attractor, yeah. right? You, oh, that's just like an attendance that someone has. But then you you kind of get into it more, and and that's hard to do by yourself, like to challenge your knowledge and things like that. Yeah. 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 yeah you, 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 really sorry, my Yeah, my quite a discussion of uh, <laughs> when it's called an environment. So, is placing something on the floor is that. Uh, constraining the environment <laughs> or it's constraining the task and uh, <laughs> there's so much inter interesting discussions about that and uh, even just what is that constraint what is the task mm -hmm. what is the environment and yeah. debating about that is already very very helpful yeah yeah surrounding yourself with like-minded people i think it's very important mm -hmm. they will afford you to learn and mm -hmm. and learn more and more on the on the ecological dynamics approach yeah, and it yeah, never it, ne yeah. Yeah. it never ends. Franz and Franz argues with me about constraints. What kind of constraint the, that is versus this? So, yeah, uh, we, never it never ends. Yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah, that's part of the you know it's not a static thing. I think that's you know part of yeah. things. So yeah, well, well, great guys. I think that was good. I really appreciate. It. I think you know um, as I said, there's some of the themes you guys brought up are common ones I've been hearing from other coaches. I think. Um, but I think it's a, a, a really great uh, application of this ecological dynamics and physical therapy. I really, I really believe it. Like, it, you know, like you said, most people are open to it and makes a lot of sense. So I really hope, uh, hope you continue and <laughs> it goes well. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coach meetup, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. <laughs>